Okay, next speaker is my dear colleague of almost 40 years, Victor Friedman, a retired linguist of the Balkans from the University of Chicago, and he's made a big effort. His talk will be Judesmo in Macedonia, North Macedonia. Okay. <laughs> Actually, Yitzhak, I took you at your word. The title you assigned me was Judesmo in Macedonia. Okay. Macedonia, at the beginning of the ninth of the twentieth century, was all a part of Ottoman Turkey. It consisted of three vilayets, actually two and a half, but never mind. The vilayet of Selyanik, Salonika, the vilayet of Manastir, which is now Bitola, and the vilayet that was called at some points Kosova but whose capital was Iskip, Skopje. It was this set of Ottoman territories that was divided among three, three and a half, if you will, Balkan nation states. Greece got its dream territory of what is today its northern boundary, even though Nobody living north of Kozani, except in a few of the cities, spoke Greek. Never mind. Bulgaria got 10% because they lost the Second Balkan War, but Nevrokop and Gorna um, nowadays Gotsedelchev and Blagoevgrad, had Jewish and we can assume safely Judesmo speaking populations. That's Bulgaria for people who don't understand. Oh, sorry. They I don't know. Bulgaria. Most people don't know where you're talking about. Okay. Oh, 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 the northern part of Greece. Everybody's heard of Greece, right? We've had lots of Greek in this in this presentation so far. In fact, I wanted to read you a little statement. Um, our uh, colleague, Dr. Hagoel. Uh, oh, lele. Oh, I can't. Oh, wait a minute. He's Isaac, send me send me the presentations. I did. Yeah, it. Yeah. Go check your uh, Gmail. Yeah. Um, oh, it, it looks like I closed it by mistake. Well, never mind. The Greek constitution constitution begins with, in the name of the Father and the name of the indivisible Trinity and Jesus Christ. It's the second article of the Greek constitution is all about not translating the New Testament into any language but that approved by the Greek Orthodox Church, which is given precedence as the normal religion of Greece, although religious minorities, religious minorities are allowed, but they're still Greeks. So <clears throat> the 1996 volume of Eleniki Dialectologia had the, the community, the body, Bilingual communities of Greece. God forbid there should be anybody who's monolingual in Greece, except for Greek, of course. So they had Pomakika, which is Muslim Bulgarian. They had Hispano Hebraica, which is Judesmo. They had Oive, ah, <laughs> Vahika. Um, they had Arvanitika, and they had Muslimanika. Muslimanikatis Trakis, that's Muslimish of Thrace. They wouldn't dare say Turkish, right? Turkish sounds like an ethnic minority. And Chasva Khalila, that the Greeks should have any ethnic minorities. They don't. I have a wonderful overhead from Maxim magazine where there are these, these, these ladies in bikinis, and there's a Miss Greece and a Miss Singapore and a Miss This and a Miss That. And the Miss Greece, everyone has a, a hometown fact. So hometown fact of Singapore is, you know, they won the Guinness Book of World Records for stuffing cars full of people or something. And the Greek hometown fact is there are no ethnic minorities in Greece. This is, this is Maxim Magazine. This is a kind of, you know, my colleague whose son was at the time a kind of person who, who read that kind of magazine. That's how I saw it. They is there. Anyway, um, Greece, yes. So there were Jews in Greece. Salonika was basically a Greek, I'm sorry, a Jewish city. 55,000 
Jews, according to Kantroff in 1900. Including, there were many more, there were about 80,000. That's right, because the other 31,000 were Dinmeh. They were- No, no, Muslims. no, no. 80,000 <laughs> Sephardic Jews and another 15,000 Dunmeh. Okay, I big as it, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not sorry, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm not sorry. You know, I, if Kantroff says 50, 55,000, it's gotta be bigger anyway, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, so there were Jews all over the Macedonian territory that was subdivided after the Balkan Wars of 1913. There were three little chunks that went to Albania and um, they were all villages and there were no Jews at least not as we can tell. Um, very few Jews living in villages in Macedonia, almost everybody in the cities. And, you know, I could do like what other people have done and just start reading. Solun, Ber, Enige Vardar, that's Janitsa now. Strumitsa, Doiran, Langada, Seres, Gorna Jumaya, that's in Bulgaria. Uh, Nevrokop, that's in Bulgaria. Kostor, that's Greek, Kastoria. Drama in Greece, Kavala in Greece. Skopje, capital of what's now North Macedonia. Kumanovo, Shtip. Also in North Macedonia, Pitola in North Macedonia, Lerin, which the Greeks call Florina, Castoria, I think I mentioned Kostur. But what's interesting here, something that you don't know, is that there were Jews in Ohrid. Ohrid is on the south westernmost corner of North Macedonia. And it was a very famous seat of Slavic learning. And a, a word or two about, you know, how did I get into this sort of thing? Um, I actually started out as a Russian major in college. And then I went to Russia and I saw what a wretched place it was. And thank God my grandparents left. And so I naturally went into South Slavic. So I was, I was sort of like, um, oh, what was, oh hang, on, oh, hang on, I'm sorry. I'm being a little tired. It's been a long day. Uh, is it? Oh, no, no. Uh, so it was. Uh, no, no, no. What are you thinking about? One, the, the one who was singing was that Shoshana who was singing with all the different instruments? No, Judith Cohen. Judith. Judith, like Judith, like Judith, I was a folk dancer. And um, so I went, went into South Slavic and then I had a chance to go to what was then the Socialist Republic of Macedonia within the federal, uh, SFRY, the Socialist Federated Republic of Yugoslavia and learn Macedonian. And there were all these other languages. There's Albanian and there was Armenian and Romany and so on. And I thought, wow, this place is really fun and different and cool. And, you know, and unlike Greece, where a colleague of mine did his field work in the Macedonian speaking village of, of what is Greek Nestorion or Macedonian Nestram, um, in the beginning of his book, uh, which describes a dialect, he thanks the Greek police for teaching him to always make up, make a backup copy of his tapes because in fact, they arrested him, confiscated his capes and destroyed them. But he had a backup <laughs> copy, so he got to publish the book anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, Macedonia, I, I, I was just studying Macedonian, so it wasn't really a problem. There are problems, of course, uh, in every country, as we know, uh, the US especially these days, but never mind. Um, so I studied Macedonian and then became interested in the other languages of Macedonia, especially, Albanian, Aromanian, Romani. And I only came to Judesmo rather late because, and here's a point, and it's a point worth making. Um, there was a Danish linguist named Christian Sandfeld who made his name with a doctoral dissertation called in Danish, Balkan Philologian, which nobody read because it was in Danish in 1926, but it was translated into French in 1930. And La Linguistique Balkanique became the classic of Balkan linguistics. 
And in that book, he brought together a century's worth of research on the classic Balkan languages, Balkan Slavic, that's Bulgarian, Macedonian, southeastern most dialects of the former Serb Croatian, Balkan Romance, that's Romanian, Aromanian, Magdalena Romanian, Albanian, and Greek. In footnote two, he explicitly excludes Romani and Judesma, saying they're not part of the Balkan Linguistic League because their languages have nothing to do with the convergences that the Balkans show. And so one of the things that I've spent some time doing is showing that, well, in Romania, there's no question that there are convergences. It's, it's, it's an easy business. In Judesmo, as it is spoken in the Balkans, there are constructions Words are, words are easy to, to, to talk about, you know, Hanukalik, right, from Menorah, uh, Hanukia in uh, modern parlance. Um, but the exclusion of Judesmo from Balkan linguistics, that is the exclusion of the Balkan dialects of Judesmo, is something that I have been Oh, in a sense, campaigning against, if you will. Um, it isn't to say that Judesmo looks just like every other Balkan language, it doesn't. But it has enough features in it, for example, um, uh, it, in order to say, you know, is it okay? You don't say se puede, you simply say puede or puede, depending on the dialect, uh, which is a direct calc of the Balkan Slavic. So, um, and I, I have many, there's a, uh, Marie-Christine uh, Varro has a wonderful example from, um, from Istanbul where they use a pluperfect instead of a simple past because they are calcing the Turkish evidential in Mish. And it's, it's the same kind of process that actually occurs in Quechua Spanish, the Spanish of Peru spoken by native speakers of Quechua. I mean, anyway, so I have, I have lots and lots of technical examples, but I'm not gonna bore you because it's late and I'm tired and you're tired and so on. So I'm gonna tell you a, a couple more stories. Um, Marco Tsepenkov in the 19th century was a merchant in Prilap. In, in Turkish. And he collected folk tales. And he, his works come to 10 volumes, or four if the paper is bigger and print is smaller, but five. Um, there's one volume, though, called Anecdotes. Anecdotes are jokes. And ethnic jokes are really interesting because they give you an insight into the stories that were circulating in the middle of the 19th century in what is today North Macedonia. And so I went through all two or 300 of them looking for any in which a character speaking in what today we call Macedonian switched into a different language. And indeed, the Albanians speak Albanian, the Greeks speak Greek, the Gypsies speak Romani, the Aromanians speak Vlach, but the Jews, the Jews speak Turkish. <laughs> they do not speak Judesmo in the stories that were circulating in the Prilep marketplace in the middle of the 19th century, which shows you the way, and you know, David Bunis tells a, a story the way, you know, there would be people in the marketplace who would learn, especially the Vlachs, right? Our Romanian is a Romance language like Spanish. They're separated, but there's plenty of, of room for figuring things out between our Romanian and the our Romanians also were merchants like, like successful Jews. And, so what the Jews in that area would do is switch into the higher register and use Hebrew. 
instead of Judesmo, if there was somebody in the shop that might be could understand or overhear. So Judesmo in Macedonia. Oh, I'll tell a couple more stories. Um, there was um, uh, Ambassador Orian mentioned uh, Esther Ovadia, uh, whose uh, nom de guerre was Mara. Um, she's honored in Bitola because she was martyred. But in fact, there were three girls that ran away to join the partisans. Uh, Esther was one, Jamilo Kolonomos was the second, and Rosa Kamchi was the third. And Jamila also escaped and fought and produced, um, among other things, um, this book, Sefarski Oglasi, uh, Sephardic uh, Echoes or Voices, Voices, I think, exactly like, like uh, my colleague's presentation just now. Um, Rosa Kamchi got caught. But she was caught after the deportation. The deportation was March 12th or so, roughly, when they gathered people up in Monopol. And the Bulgarians, and it was the Bulgarians who did all the Germans' dirty work for them and were paid for it. Rosa, the Bulgarians, didn't want to pay the money they would have to pay to ship her to Treblinka. The Germans were going to charge them. So instead, they threw her in jail, and she survived the war that way. The other survivors, there was one Jew left in Bitola in 2009, but he has passed on now. There are Jews still in Prizren, in Kosovo. When I last talked with them, and this was this is already more than 10 years ago, there were 48 Jews in Prizren. They spoke Turkish at home, just like every city resident in Prizren, which is in Kosovo, but in the south. West. And you know, there there are there are stories still to be told. There are languages still to be studied. Um, the Turkish of Prizren in and of itself is a very interesting dialect. And I haven't had the time to look at the whether the Jewish Turkish is different from, from the uh, Muslim uh, or Christian Turkish, but it would be worth doing. Prizren was the one city where the Jews were left in peace during the civil wars and uh, the NATO war and so on. The Jews in Pristina were mostly from Serbia and went to Belgrade. There's still a Jewish cemetery in Pristina. Uh, it is in disrepair, but it's on a hill and nobody, nobody goes there to do anything. So. It's not, it's, it's not that it's been desecrated. Unlike what happened in Salonika, where the Greeks built the University of Thessaloniki on top of the Jewish cemetery. But so it goes. Um, what else? What else? What else? Oh, you know, I could go on and on about, about um, grammatical features and linguistic stuff, but I think- Well, why don't you explain one there. thing? What are the Bulgarian influences in Macedonian, in the language, mm. Mm -hmm. okay? As opposed Excellent to local question. Macedonian issues. Uh, yeah, influence. the Macedonian issues. So the Greeks objected to the use of the name Macedonia and then they agreed on North Macedonia, fine. In the Prespa agreement, it states that the language is called Macedonian. And the identity of the people's people is Macedonian slash citizen of Macedonia, because Macedonian could be ethnic or civil. Um, whereas in Greece, there is no ethnic identity allowed. So it's very different. Um, anyway, um, Bulgarian and Macedonian and Serbian form part of a large linguistic continuum. It's, it's hard for people who don't, I mean, all right. Spanish, Portuguese, Galician, Aragonese, Catalan, Occitan, all the various Romance languages that are contiguous, Italian. I mean, I've been with a, 
a colleague of mine who speaks Spanish and not Italian, and we went to an Italian restaurant in Italy, and she just spoke Spanish, he spoke Italian, and they had a long, you know, they understood each other. We ordered, fine. So Macedonian, Bulgarian, and Serbian, or Bulgarian, Macedonian, Serbian, it's that kind of continuum. What happened in the latter half of the 19th century was, but during the first half of the 19th century, there was a big fight between the Bulgarians and the Greeks. The Bulgarians wanted to have their own language in church and the Greeks wanted to Hellenize everybody. And by the way, Helene was a crime in the Byzantine empire. They were Romans, they were Romyoi, Romyos, Romaika, was the word for Greek until the late 18th, early 19th but century. A Hellene would be a pagan. That's, That's right. That's right. And after Constantine the Terrible or the Great, depending on your point of view, that was a crime. Being pagan was a crime. So being a Hellene was a crime. And it wasn't until the 18th and 19th centuries with the Germans and the English and so on that Hellene suddenly became an ideal and Hellenization became a goal. Although the Greeks, including the Romeos, destroyed Slavic books whenever they got the chance, even during the Byzantine period. When they conquered the first Bulgarian empire, they destroyed all the Bulgarian, what would be called, the Bulgarians called Bulgarian, become Church Slavonic books. And that's why there aren't any from that period, except the ones that survived in Moscow and outside of Byzantium. Hmm. John Fine, uh, the early medieval Balkans has the references and information. Vladimir Morshin wrote the article, uh, but it's in Russian, so if you read Russian, fine. Um, early 19th century, the fight is between the Greeks and the Bulgarians over who's going to control ecclesiastical territory, revenues, language, and so on. And the Greeks are being very Hellenizing. I mean, uh, Cosmas the Aetolian, who ran around Epirus and uh, Chamaria in southern Albania, telling everybody that Aromanian is the language of the devil and only Greek should be spoken. It's just like the language oaths that the Greeks made people sign um, after World War II and after the Civil War, um, where Macedonian speakers were forced to sign, swear that they would not speak this language, where they threw mothers in jail and never mind, uh, I could go on, but I won't. I mean, I was attacked. I was personally assaulted by the Golden Dawn at the promotion wow. of the first Greek, no, I'm sorry, Macedonian Greek yes. dictionary. They saw it on ah, television. Yeah, I, yeah, I know <laughs> I it's on television. Yeah. The it's not on television. Music. Yeah, no, no, I was there. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I got back to Macedonia. So I come to TV, come to TV, come to TV. And I had to go to dinner, you know. But um, uh, yeah, so, um, so the, the real contestation in the early 19th century was between Greece, Greek and Bulgarian. Bulgarian didn't even have a real meaning at that time. It was just any Slavic dialect whatsoever. And there were Macedonian speakers who wanted Bulgarian to be based on what today we would call Macedonian dialects. And they published articles in Istanbul and Constantinople on the principles of literary Bulgarian. <clears throat> and it was basically everything that, that, that characterizes Macedonian today. What happened was the center of power shifted to Northeastern Bulgaria for various reasons. Standard Bulgarian is based on Northeastern Bulgarian dialects. Standard Macedonian is based on West Central Bul Macedonian dialects. The point is the whole, the whole area is a continuum, but there is no, no. There's, how shall I put this? Bulgarian is influenced by Russian. They have participles that Bulgarian doesn't have. Um, many, many things. 
and their Cyrillic is based on Russian. Macedonian is influenced by Serbian, and its Cyrillic is the Cyrillic that Vukaradzic came up with, which is linguistically sound. It's basically one letter per phoneme. So if you want to write ya, you write j a. And if you want to write ya in Bulgarian, you've got two ways. If you want to write yo, you've got four ways. It's totally different in terms of the writing systems. So um, uh, the current Bulgarian nonsense, uh, you know, my personal feeling is that it's Russian inspired, but I could be mistaken there. But it's certainly helping the Russians to keep Macedonia out of the EU, because as Dr. Yanev said, the, the name change was to get into NATO, but it was also to get into the EU. That was supposed to be part of the deal. And yes, it, it was some kind of a bargain, like we are losing yeah. something, but we are we are preserving the borders and right. Preserve the borders, preserve the word Macedonia in the name, yes, name yes. preserve the name Macedonian for the language. Okay, it says yes. in the press that Macedonian is a Slavic language. That's true. That's yes, good. Yes, right? yes. It's much better than those stupid Vumaro. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, why why can... why do the Bulgarian why does Macedonia yeah. look toward Bulgaria? You would think they would look toward they don't. Serbian. They well, don't. no, they... but but that, that's their motivation in Bulgaria. What? Wait, Bulgaria never name? misses an opportunity to uh, to inspire Macedonia. No, no, Mas Bulgaria never loses an opportunity to try to reclaim Macedonia. Okay, whose Jews it exported and killed. Now, why did I mean the Jews of of what is today North Macedonia? That was those were Bulgarians that rounded them up. Those were Bulgarians. That no, sent no, no, them that's no. But the whole I, I M R O phenomenon. We want to be a part of a larger Bulgaria. Oh, that's okay. You know, yes, I, 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 um, if you're talking about Vumaro today, no. If no, you're no, talking about Vumaro in the 20th in the past, century, there were two, he means about the organization, were, not political party. There were two Vumaros. Right. There were yes. two Vumaros. Okay. There was a yes, left wing and right wing. Right wing were collaborations with Sofia and left wing kid ethnic Macedonian they, identity. Macedonia and Macedonia. Okay. They didn't yes. want to be Mac part Macedon of Macedonia this. to Macedonians. And, and it's that left wing that, that well, Kirsten Miserkov in 1903 produced a book in Macedonian dialect that was so close to standard Macedonian today, that as a young student, I could read it. I could not have read something in Bulgarian as easily yes. as I read that book. The Macedonian Tarabot about Macedonian yeah. matters. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, so, so what Bulgaria is doing right now is being Russia's pawn, as far as I'm concerned. The other part is the right wing assholes who would kill Jews anyway. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I've had it. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just over it. Judesmo in, in Bulgaria exists still. Um, a colleague of mine, um, uh, Iskra Dobreva, has written a doctoral dissertation on Judesmo, written in Cyrillic letters from the archives in Sofia and also uh, the Vomoro Museum, I think. Um, so you know. But they don't, they don't want to hear anything about Balkan features. <laughs> Everything has to be pure. Eh. Uh, no. Cindy, did you have a question for Victor? Uh, if you're talking to me, no, I did not have a question. Oh. I just said ah, thumbs up. Put, ah, OK. Ah. It was a thumbs up, not a question. Oh, Thank okay. you. <laughs> I didn't see, but I appreciate. <laughs> So, so, you know, I guess that's, you know, that's, if there are any other questions, feel free. Um, uh, I, you know, it's already kind of late and I just had cancer surgery the day before yesterday. So I'm kind of tired. <laughs> so, okay, I will just comment. Thank you for the presentation and 
hope to see you in the future in Skopje, and I will send to your email my, my works on Macedonian and English. We will see. I like, was going to ask you, you know, yeah, yeah. Makeonski, Mo, so my, my doctor thesis is published yes. on Macedonia. No, it is about the Jewish community from 1700 until 1912. Great. Also some articles and... No, Lusaka. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Thank you. So, so Victor, so as usual, you've been enlightening, okay? Informative, controversial, and, uh, you know, you add some spice. And now we understand... Uh, a tiny bit more, the Balkan fiasco, conflict, et cetera, et cetera. It goes into the linguistic uh, realm, not just in terms of nationalistic. And, and you explained how uh, Judeo-Spanish uh, is, is discriminated in, uh, in the linguistic politics in the Balkans. 